guys had a great week? Yeah. I have had a great week. I've been glad to be here. I just want to encourage you, I know you probably already have, but make sure that you thank your faculty. Uh, they came here this week to push you, to challenge you, but they came here because they love you and they care about you. And so I just want to make sure that I encourage you to, to take time to, to thank them for the investment that they've made in your life this week. So find them later on today. Let them know that you appreciate them and are thankful for them. They, they care about you far more than you know. And uh, after sing time, they gather and they pray for you. So just know that you are loved by your faculty. Even when they're pushing you and challenging you, they're doing it because they love you and they want to, to see God's best done in your life. So uh, make sure you let them know that you're thankful for them. Question for you this morning. Have you ever gotten mad and then done something you regretted? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Would you like me to tell a story on myself to uh, help illustrate this message better? Or would you rather me not tell the embarrassing story about myself? Tell it? No tell. Alright, raise your hand if you want me to tell it. Alright. <laughs> That's close enough to unanimous. Um, several, I, I was, uh, I believe, just out of high school. I was in or community college, I think. And I was playing on our church's softball team. And for a while, I really began to feel like the, the coach was not being very fair with the playing time. Uh, you know, certain people got to play the whole game all the time. And others of us only ever got to play a couple innings or maybe half the game at best. And in my mind, I'm just starting to think, you know, this isn't fair. This isn't, this isn't right. This isn't being done right. But I didn't say anything. You know, I just sort of went along with it. Well, there came a game, and I was playing out in right field or right center, I'm not sure. And, and the ball was hit out there towards the gap. I mean, it was deep. And I took off on the dead run, and I could run faster then. And so I was uh, on the dead run tracking this ball. And it was just, it was just almost out of reach. And it, at the last second, I leaped, and I dove. And lo and behold, the ball ended up in my glove. <laughs> All right? It's sort of like the broken clock is right twice a day thing. It just happened. And of course, you know, the adrenaline and the excitement and the enthusiasm. And you know I don't get real excited when I play sports. But, um, <laughs> but I got a little bit excited. And so I'm just, you know, high-fiving the other outfielders. It was the last out of the inning. And I was due to come up to bat that next inning. And I was so excited. And I was pumped up. And I was running in. And I got to the dugout. And the coach said, uh, you're out of the game. Got to put someone else in. And I thought, no. <laughs> and so I decided that this would be a great moment to confront him about his coaching decisions. <laughs> Shocking, isn't it? And so I, I decided to confront him. And, and he sort of you know, had the wisdom that this wasn't probably the right time for this confrontation. So he's tried to sort of avoid the conversation. And I was like, no, you're not going to avoid this conversation. I'm right. I'm mad. And we're going to have this con And I even used some scripture verses to substantiate my position. <laughs> yeah, nice touch. And so um, it, it really wasn't probably all that, that pleasant. And, um, and for a while, I mean, even all the way home and all that night and even the next few days, I was still sure that I was right and that I had done right. Uh, but I came to realize that what I had done wasn't right. And although I had a very legitimate claim for which I could have had a calm and peaceful discussion in private with the coach, uh, what I chose to do wasn't right because I acted out of anger and I acted out of emotion and I handled a situation in a way I shouldn't have. It led me to end up having to share an apology in front of the whole softball team. So um, I share that to, to let you know that we all have to deal with our temper. We all have to deal with anger. It's, it's part of who we are and God wants us to handle our anger and our temper differently. And instead of having a natural response, he wants us to have a supernatural response. And that's kind of what we've been talking about with this dress code, is that God wants you and I to have a supernatural response to life. And we're to clothe ourselves with these characteristics that come from the Spirit of God, and we're to wear them and demonstrate them in our lives, because God, through Christ, calls you and I to live a supernatural life. Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. He says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. 
So Paul there in Romans, he says, he says, never avenge yourself. Never take it upon yourself to get back or to get even. Now that's one thing to read. It's one thing to believe. But what? It's a whole other thing to do what? To do it. Right? It's easy to say, okay, I agree with that. But it's really hard to do. It says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So how do we do that? How do we live that? How do we lengthen the fuse, if you will? Well, it comes from the last piece of clothing that we're going to talk about in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Just to refresh us, Paul says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, right? We talked about compassion. And then we talked about kindness. And kindness and compassion, they all flow out of each other, right? Our compassion leads us to kindness. We talked about humility. And humility leads us to meekness. You know, meekness is very much humility lived out in our life. And then the last one is patience. And what I want you to see this morning is patience is basically meekness lived out in our lives. Humility, meekness, patience, they all go together. Patience. How many of you have ever prayed for patience? All right. That's brave. All right. It's brave when we pay, pray for patience because when we pray for patience, we know God's going to answer that prayer because God always answers prayer when we pray according to his will. Did you know that? He will, well, he always answers our prayers always. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's not now. Sometimes it's what were you thinking, right? <laughs> But when we pray something that is God's will for our life, He will always answer in the positive. And so, we are to have patience. What do you think about when you hear the word patience? What, what just pops into your mind when you hear the word patience? Somebody. Children. Children, all right. If you're going to have children, you better have patience. Yes. Waiting for dinner, Waiting for dinner <laughs> requires patience. So hungry. When you're a teenage boy, you can never, ever become full. It's just not possible. <laughs> the moment you're full, you're not full anymore. Patience involves waiting. It involves length, right? So we, we understand that, that patience involves a length of something. And literally the word that Paul uses here is, is best translated long-tempered. To be long-tempered. It's the opposite of quick anger or resentment or revenge. And so Paul is saying, because of our standing with God, right, because we are His chosen children, because we belong to Him, because we're in Christ, because we're holy, set apart, and because we are loved, because God has this unlimited, unending affection for us, he says, here are some things I want you to clothe yourselves with. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness. And the fifth one is patience. And all of these as we looked back on Monday, if you remember, tie into verse 14, where Paul says, above all, clothe yourselves with what? Love. Clothe yourself with love. All five of these things, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, all five of them are aspects of how we are to clothe ourselves with love. And as God's children, He wants us to reflect love. Love is to be the most defining characteristic of our lives as followers of Christ. It's the overarching theme of the New Testament that God's children should be defined by the radical love that they've received in Christ. Practicing it, it's hard, right? It's difficult. So, in order to help us, once again, I want us to look at the life of Jesus. And in looking at the life of Jesus this morning, we're also going to look into the lives of his disciples and his followers. And we're going to look at just a quick little story from the Gospel of Luke. And it's found in Luke chapter 9. And we're going to look at verses 51 through 55. So, if you have your Bible this morning, Luke chapter 9. Verses 51 through 55. Sort of an interesting little story here that we're going to read. And I think from it we're going to see how Jesus demonstrated patience and how his disciples struggled with it a little bit. So Luke chapter 9 and uh, beginning in, in verse 51. Luke 9, 51. It says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. 
And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from them, from heaven and consume them? But he turned to them and he rebuked them. And they went on to another village. Pretty interesting little story, isn't it? Let's just take a few moments to, to set this up. It says that, that, it, that um, in verse 51, that the days drew near for him to be taken up. Jesus' great purpose always was the cross. His ministry was always about a movement towards the cross. It's why he came. And it says here there's a shift in Luke's gospel here. Now, from this point on, it's about the events leading up and this movement towards Jerusalem. And Jesus is going to visit Jerusalem a few times, but it's more than just visiting Jerusalem. It's where his destination to die for our sins would be accomplished. And so it says they are traveling, so they're going to be traveling from the, sort of from the north. They're up in Galilee. They're going to be traveling to the south to go to Jerusalem. And they have to go through where? Samaria. We talked about it the other day. Jews don't normally travel to Samaria, but Jesus wasn't normal. Aren't you thankful for that? All right, there's hope for you and me. And so they're going to travel to Samaria. So Jesus sends some people ahead to make travel arrangements. It's a long journey, so they're going to have to spend the night. So he sends them to a village to make some travel arrangements. Jesus is on a journey, not just towards a place, but towards a purpose. And so he sends them to make arrangements. So look at what it says. It says, he sent them into a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But what happens? Verse 53. It doesn't go very well, does it? Look, look at what it says. It says, but when the, the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. They weren't warmly received. So they come into the town and they said, we need some, we need some accommodations for our entourage, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's 12 of us plus Jesus. We, we need some accommodations. We need a place to stay. And it didn't go so well. Why? Because there's conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans. Remember they have a worship conflict? The, the Samaritans, remember John chapter 4? She says, hey, we worship here and you worship there. And, and, and the Samaritans in this village were not interested in Jesus. And they certainly weren't interested in a Jesus who was on his way to Jerusalem. You ever notice how sometimes we, we want God to conform to our plans and our ways? Have you ever been there? Have you ever made some great plans or had some great desires, or at least you thought they were great, and you thought, God, I really want you to bless this? You ever notice how we pray sometimes? We say, God, I've got these plans, and I'd like your blessings stamped on them. I, I want you to conform to my ways and to my plans and to my ideas. And it doesn't work that way, but that's what they were thinking. And if Jesus was going to Jerusalem, they didn't want any part of him. And so they rejected him. And they rejected his followers. And it doesn't feel good to be rejected, does it? You ever been rejected before? How did it make you feel? Somebody. How did it feel when you got rejected? No one? Bad. Huh? Bad? Bad? Did you get mad? Yeah. All right. It's normal to get mad when you're rejected. It's normal. It should not feel good. All right? And so they get mad. And I don't think that this whole conversation was exactly on the polite level. You, you don't really get that impression from the text, do you? I, I don't think that it really went so well. I'm sure in the midst of there was some, some ugly words. All right? I'm sure that this was not a pleasant conversation. I'm sure there's some hurtful things said. There may have even been some, your mama. You know what I'm saying? You know, you know how it gets. And... We don't know all that went down, but we know that it had to be a humiliating thing for the disciples. Because here, here's the thing, the disciples, they're, they're part of the inner circle and they really thought they were special. In fact, if you read back in Luke chapter 9, uh, they were having arguments about who was the greatest. Look at verse, four, if you have your Bible, Luke chapter 9 verse 46, it says, An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. <laughs> Can you imagine that? The disciples were like, no, no, I'm the best. No, no, I'm the best. The only one that did not get in on that was James the Less. All right? <laughs> he knew he wasn't the greatest. Isn't that sad? We'll come back to him next week. 
Well, James and John and some of the rest of the disciples, they, they roll into town with Jesus and they, they find out that the travel arrangements haven't gone well. And so James and John, their brothers, they have a little conversation. Maybe they were whispering. And they're like, I know, I know what he did. Yeah, yeah. Jesus, can we call down fire from heaven? They rejected you. They rejected us. Let's burn them up. Right? Can, can we just call fire down? Let's just des destroy them. And it's easy to sort of jump on their case a little bit. Man, how unspiritual were they? But have you ever wanted to call fire down on someone? If you could have, would you have? It's a good thing you can, isn't it? <laughs> how do you respond when you're humiliated? How do, you respond, how do you respond when you're cheated, when you're taken advantage of, when you're treated wrongly? The pressure that we face is to what? Is to retaliate, to get back, to get even, to settle the score, to pay them back. Have you ever wanted to pay somebody back? Yes, it's okay to raise your hand. The camera is not on you. <laughs> and a lot of times we don't just want to pay back, do we? We like to pay back with interest. Right? We pay back to even things up and then we pay back a little more to finish the punishment. But what we're doing is we're taking things in our own hands. And it's exactly what God says don't do. He says never avenge yourselves. Don't take it into your own hands. And that's what James and John want to do and they wanted to involve Jesus in it. But Jesus demonstrates patience for us. He calls us to handle our hurts differently. Differently than maybe we've been taught to. Differently than we want to. Differently than we feel like. Because you're always going to feel like paying back. But here's the thing. You don't need to let your feelings be in control. Your feelings are good. God gave you feelings. Because God is a God who has feelings. All right? Our feelings are an integral part of who we are. But they are not to be the decision maker. And God teaches us how to handle it differently. To be supernatural in our response. To clothe ourselves with humility. Jesus demonstrated what to do. Isn't it interesting that he did not rebuke the Samaritans who rejected him, but he rebuked his disciples. He rebuked... Can you imagine? Can you imagine how they, they were like, you're rebuking us? Jesus, these people are rejecting you. We, we follow you. We've given up everything and we, we, we've given our lives to serve you and to follow you and you're rebuking us. He rebuked them and he moved on. And Jesus showed us how we can model patience. Paul lists patience as one of the fruits of the Spirit, which means it's something that God produces in us. So we don't have to go out and find this patience. Isn't that great? This thing that, that Paul says we're to clothe ourselves with is something God's given you. It's already in your wardrobe. Are you with me? It's there. It's in the closet. You have it available to you. You just have to choose to put it on. And you know, it's really interesting, but that situation that happened to me, and it wasn't the only time in my life where my temper was shorter than it should have been, but God used that in my life to reveal to me that there was a work of, of His grace that needed to happen in my life, that there needed to be a lengthening of my fuse. And God wants to lengthen our fuse. He wants us to have a supernatural response because God is a God of patience. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. You don't have to turn there, but it talks about how God is a patient God. In fact, Paul is arguing there that they are presuming on the patience of God, but God is a patient God. He's patient with us. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that God has a long fuse? All right? The reality of God's patience and God's kindness, and that we are recipients of it, should lead us to want to clothe our lives and to dress our lives with patience. It's not condoning the wrong. It's not saying what happened to you is right. It's not, not dealing with it in a correct and biblical way. But it's choosing not to retaliate, not to revenge, not to take justice into your own hands. James chapter 1. Verses 19 and 20. Let me move on here. Maybe I don't have this on a slide. 
know this. I still only have half a screen, so I'm guessing where I'm at. Let's see if we can go back. There we go. James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Look at, listen to what James says. He says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear. That means listen. Slow to speak. Slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Let me ask you that question again. Have you ever done something when you were mad that you regretted? Think about that moment. Just take, it, take a moment and think about that time where you got angry and you felt very right about being angry. You felt very justified about being angry. But then you did something and later on you thought, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't done that. And you see, wearing patience not only helps us to reflect the characteristic of Christ, not only is it something we're told to do, but it's good for us. It's good for us. It's the way of love. It's the way of Jesus. Psalm 37 verse 8 says this, Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, for it only tends to evil. You and I have been called to wear patience, literally being long-tempered, lengthening the fuse. So here's a great way to think about it. This will help you. I really believe this is going to help you remember. All right, God wants you to lose your temper. Isn't that great? God wants you to lose your temper, and by lose, I mean lose it. Get rid of it. Lengthen it so that it's not a part of your life anymore. All right, because we can go about losing our temper, but instead we need to lose our temper. God wants you to lose your temper. He wants to lengthen your fuse because it's the way of Jesus. It's what God's called you to model, and it's good for you. So can you remember that? You think you'll remember that? All right, just remember, God wants me to lose my temper. He wants me to clothe myself with his love. And let's just tie things up back there in Colossians 3.14. Paul says, above all, put, above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. God loves harmony. And he desires for there to be harmony in our lives. And he desires there to be harmony among his body, the church. And it will only happen when we clothe ourselves with the things that we are told to wear. You see, your faith isn't just about you. When God saves you, He calls you into a relationship with Himself. He gives you Himself. He calls you then also to be part of His family. God is your Father and other Christians are your brothers and sisters. And so you have relationship now and responsibilities to the family. And how you interact with and relate to the family is something that God cares deeply about. The night before Jesus died, He prayed for unity in His church. And we'll experience unity, we'll experience harmony in our lives and in our relationships when we wear what God has called us to wear. And in order for that to happen, we have to avoid the clothing battle with our Heavenly Father and trust Him and really believe that it's the best way for us to live. I want to close with Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. It wasn't in my notes, this, but I, as I was uh, just spending a little time with the Lord this morning, came to this verse. Galatians 5.13 For you were called to freedom. It's July 4th. Right? It's the day that we celebrate our freedom as a nation, as a people. But I want you to know that, that God is a God who also calls and offers freedom. And he says, You were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. The freedom that God gives us is not to live for ourselves, because that's not freedom. Because living for yourself is ultimately sinful. And sin never brings freedom. Sin promises freedom, but sin makes you a slave. God wants you to live free. He wants you to enjoy the freedom that He purchased. And He wants you to use the freedom that you have to love and serve others. You have an amazing opportunity to live these things out next week. Before you even get home, you have an amazing opportunity. We're about to get invaded by a hundred more of your friends. And it's going to change things around here. And it's going to be different. But you've been brought here because you are leaders 
in music and in your walk with God and in, and in your peer relationships. And I want to challenge you to set the tone for camp next week. I believe God wants to do some great things this summer. I've been praying that, that God will do a greater work than he's ever done in the history of this camp this summer. And, and then I've prayed that, that that would be only for this summer because next summer would be greater. And I believe you will get to be part of that. So I want to challenge you. Set the tone. Practice these things. Practice these things on Sunday when everyone's showing up. Help them move into their room. Honor them. Look out for them. Don't act like you're something special because you got to be here at Chamber Fest and they didn't. Okay? It was very, very... It was a great honor that you were able to be here and you deserve to be here. But don't let it go here. Okay? Be humble. Be kind. Be compassionate. Be meek. Be patient. And set the tone for camp. And God will use you in a great way. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are a God of compassion. I thank you that you're a God of kindness. I thank you that you're a God of meekness. I thank you that you're a God who demonstrated what it looks like to live through giving us your son, Jesus. Father, I thank you for the kindness that you've shown us in Christ. I thank you for the patience that you show us each and every day. And Father, I pray that that you would bring us to a place where we trust you and that we learn to allow your spirit to clothe our lives with these attributes. Father, so that we can reflect you and your heart and your life. And Father, I pray that very specifically uh, that with one another here at camp and specifically next week, that you would help us to, to do these things that we've been talking about, to put them into practice. And Father, I pray that you would use our lives then to bring you honor and glory through that. And Father, we do pray that over these next four weeks that you would do a great work here at Chehi. Father, that you'd pour out your spirit. Father, that there would be growth in our walks with you. There would be growth in our music, growth in relationships. And that we would experience your goodness and your joy and your love and your grace in a powerful way. Father, we pray for this day that you'd guide us and direct us. Father, help us to lengthen our fuses. Father, so that we can have a supernatural response when we're hurt or wronged. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.